Good day everybody, RC Grab back here. Welcome back to the channel. So in my last video I finished building and installing a four foot long two track timber trestle. The bridge featured all wood construction of course and has a center how truss deck bridge. And in this video I'm going to try my hand at making some trees using some different techniques I found from a variety of sources. We'll also be taking a look at another structure for the layout and as always it will be some random unrelated content at the end of the video just to keep things interesting. So let's get started. The trees I'll be making resemble various types of pine trees and I'll be starting with the shorter ones you see here. I'll start with some balsa wood dowels, approximately 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. The dowels I have here are about a foot long so I'm going to cut them roughly in half. The balsa wood is soft and very easy to cut. Next I have some thin music wire about 0.032 inches and I'm going to use this to make a mounting pin for the tree. I'm going to cut a piece about an inch long. Now using a set of small hobby pliers I'll press the wire into the base of the tree trunk about a third of the way in and I'll secure it with some thin CA glue. I'm going to taper the trunk a bit so for that I'm just using this utility knife to carve the rough shape. Now I'll smooth it out with some 100 grit sandpaper for some rough texture. Next I'll be working on the branches and for this I'm using 28 gauge artistic wire also known as craft wire. I'm going to use this chopper to cut the wire into branches. Initially I'm cutting them all around the same size but we'll trim them up as needed later. Next I'm going to set up a blob of CA gel glue which I'm going to dip the end of the wire branches that I just cut and press them into the balsa wood trunk. So using the small pliers again I grab a wire branch close to one end and dip that end into some glue. Next I press the glued end of the branch into the balsa wood trunk. I'm starting with the lower branches here and as you can see I'm angling them downward towards the base of the trunk. On the real trees you generally see the lower branches pointing downwards and as you move up the trunk the branches begin to flatten out and then begin to point upwards as they get near the top. So I'm going to mimic that effect here. This step moves slowly at first but you eventually get into a rhythm and quicken the pace. And as you can see, as I get closer to the top, I'm starting to angle the branches upwards. I'm not worrying about the length of the branches at this time because I'll trim them up later. And now here's the trunk with all the branches in place. The lower branches are to the left and I've trimmed the upper branches to the right. Next, I'm going to paint the tree assembly with this dark brown spray paint. I've pressed the end of the trunk into another length of balsa just to make the tree easier to handle. I've also drilled this hole into this block of wood for the same reason. Now you're looking at the tree assembly after applying the brown paint. Next I'm going to apply some of this dark brown earth colored ground cover to give the tree trunk a little texture. This is Bachman Earth Fine Grade but there are also similar products by Woodland Scenics. First I start by spraying the trunk with some spray adhesive. Then I sprinkle the ground cover onto the trunk being careful to avoid the branches. This gives the trunk a rough bark effect. And here's the trunk with the ground cover applied. I think the effect looks pretty good. There are some shiny spots of glue showing through but I'll flatten those out with another light coat of paint. Next I want to set up a denser branch structure on the tree. 
and for that I'm using this Woodland Scenics 7mm long static grass. Once again I'm spraying the tree assembly with glue. I'm trying to avoid the trunk by not doing a very good job here, but the glue dries clear and I'll be painting again anyway. Now I sprinkle the static grass onto the branches. I may need to go back and apply some glue from time to time to keep the branches sticky while applying the grass. Switching the background color up a bit, you can see the grass looking a bit more like smaller branches. And with the grass fully applied, I give the assembly another coat of brown paint which evens out the color and kills any shine. Next, I will be applying some Woodland Scenics 2mm static grass in both light and dark green colors to simulate the needles on the tree. After spraying some glue onto the branch structure, I sprinkle the static grass onto the branches. During this process, you want to avoid the trunk as much as possible. Now I'm just repeating the glue and sprinkling steps until I get the effect I want. You can always experiment with the number of branches and the amount of grass to vary the density of the tree's canopy. After applying the green static grass, the tree just needs a coat of some dull coat to flatten out the shine left over from the glue. I ended up switching brands of spray glue and this time I'll be using Elmer's glue going forward which isn't nearly as shiny as what I had been using. And now, let's take a break and have a look at another set of structures for the layout. This is Skinner's Row from Fine Scale Miniatures. This kit was released in 2003 and is the sixth kit in the company's Jewel series. As usual, this structure was built by my good friend Carl who was a master model builder. Hope you enjoyed this look at Skinner's Row from Fine Scale Miniatures. Now, let's get back to making trees using some different materials and techniques. The next tree I'm going to make loosely resembles the western sugar pine, which often has a very tall branchless trunk with a cluster of foliage near the top. Starting with the trunk, I'm using slightly larger balsa wood dowels that are approximately one half inch in diameter. They are about eight inches long and will represent the exposed trunk under the foliage. For the part of the trunk mostly covered up by the foliage, I'll be using something else. For the branches, I'll be using this coconut fiber mat. This stuff is used to line planters and flower pots and the like. For the upper part of the trunk, I'll be using these wooden skewers. Now what I'm going to do is cut the mat into ever smaller strips starting at about 2 inches wide. Then I'm going to gradually decrease the width of each subsequent strip. Now I'm going to cut each strip into squares and then nip off the corners. Next I'm going to pull apart each trimming to make it roughly half as thick as it was. Once I separate the piece in two, I'm going to spread the fibers out a bit by gently tugging on them outwards.
After some time I have a nice collection of fiber discs of varying sizes. I decided that I'm going to reduce the diameter of the trunk a bit by removing some of the material. To give the trunk some texture, I first scrape it with the teeth of a razor saw and then follow that with a wire brush. Next I'm going to take a 1 8 inch drill bit and drill a hole about 3 quarters of an inch deep into one end of the trunk. This is where I'll attach the skewer. Taking the skewer, I'm going to give it a pretty good coat of spray glue. Then starting with the larger discs that I cut out of the mat, I simply poke the disc through the center and slide it onto the skewer. I then slide on more, working my way from the largest to the smallest. To get the final shape, I trim off some of the stray fibers. Once again I've given the whole assembly a coat of brown spray paint, and then some more spray glue in preparation to attach the needles. Now it's just a simple matter of sprinkling on some of the 2mm static green grass to create the needle effect. Going back to the larger trunk piece, I'm dry brushing on a blend of light gray and brown paint to bring out some of the detail. Now I'm trimming the top section with the foliage to join together with the bottom section. A little bit of glue at the joint will keep everything in place. Last bit of detail is to poke some small holes on the large part of the trunk just under the foliage and in these holes I'll glue in some sprigs of tiny branches I found on some stuff growing around outside. This simulates some of the dead branches you often see on these trees just under the canopy. And there you have it, one Ponderosa-ish looking pine tree ready to install in the layout. Only about 3,000 more to go. So that's it for the railroading portion of the video. I still have plenty of opportunities to hone my tree making skills, but now it's time for RC's grab bag. And in this segment, we'll be once again checking out some unique, vintage radio control vehicles from Tamiya. So if you're interested, stick around, otherwise see you next time. This is the Tamiya Toyota Hilux and Chevy Blazing Blazer. Both are one-tenth scale radio control vehicles released in the early 1980s that featured some truly unique features for the time. The Toyota Hilux was released in 1981, and in keeping with Tamiya's design philosophy of the time for off-road RC cars, the model featured a highly detailed plastic body sitting on top of a chassis made mostly of metal parts. But what really made the Hilux special was a pre-assembled 3-speed all-metal transmission shiftable by radio control. It also had lockable front hubs for switching between two and four wheel drive. Another first was the transistorized speed controller which was far more efficient at controlling speed than the less sophisticated mechanical speed controllers of the time that simply bled off excess power wastefully as heat. The chassis also featured a water resistant mechanism box to keep the radio receiver and servo components dry during extreme off-roading adventures. A short time later in 1982, Tamiya released a Blazing Blazer utilizing the same mechanical components as the Hilux, except the Blazer came with a 3-speed mechanical speed controller and bigger paddle tread tires. Packaging for these early 3-speeds was beautiful, and also an engineering feat of their own. The major chassis pieces were organized into neatly arranged blister packs, 
while the rest of the items were packaged in purpose-built boxes. The outside of the box had an impressive array of illustrations, starting with the beautiful artwork of the finished vehicle on the front. The sides of the box were adorned with various engineering styled images featuring differing versions of the component layout. When it came to accessories, another notable first for these vehicles was the availability of a giant rechargeable 4000 milliamp battery that while heavy, gave the vehicles about 15 minutes of runtime. And of course other parts like spare tires and the battery charger ensured many hours of enjoyment. The vehicles also required a 4 channel radio to exploit all the driving and gear changing features. So that's all we have for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. Thanks and see you next time.